Um, Azar Nafizi is, is best known as the author of the uh, national and I think international bestseller, Reading Lolita in Tehran, a memoir in books, which uh, really is an incredibly captivating and, and kind of compassionate and often really disturbing portrait of, of how the Islamic Revolution in, in Iran affected one university professor, that would be her, <laughs> uh, and her students. And um, it spent 100 plus weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, and it's been translated into 32 languages, and as I say, has won many awards. Azar is currently a fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute of Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies in Washington where she uh, is a professor of aesthetics, culture, and literature, and has taught courses on the relationship uh, between culture and politics. Um, and she's also the director of the Dialogue Project and Cultural Conversations. She studied in the US, taught in Tehran and elsewhere, and before she came back here, having um, been expelled in 1981 uh, for refusing to wear the veil. And her, she's written many uh, books, and uh, her most recent, uh, which I strongly recommend, is The Republic of Imagination, um, America in Three Books. It's, it's her reading of the relevance of American fiction and her favorite uh, novels uh, uh, through her experiences uh, and, and really a plea for sort of the way that imagination and literature um, connect us. Um, and Eli Reed. Uh, so basically what we have is we have a great writer, a great chef, a great chef, a great <laughs> photographer, a great curator. And, and so you know that, but let me say that Eli Reed is a professor of uh, photojournalism at the University of Texas, but uh, uh, that's since 2005. More importantly, he is um, a great photojournalist and photographer who has been with the uh, Magnum Photos since 1983. You've seen his work in pretty much uh, all of your favorite magazines and uh, in many exhibitions. It's extraordinary. His uh, personal books include Beirut, City of Regrets, um, Black in America from 1997, and um, most recently his uh, really extraordinary retrospective that I spent a lot of time with in the last week, um, Eli Reed, A Long Walk Home, which was uh, published in Texas, uh, tech by Texas Press not long ago. He also has won uh, an enormous number of awards, and he's also worked uh, in documentary film and um, as uh, on film industry sets as a still photographer uh, in all sorts of films that you've, you've certainly seen. Um, he's currently working on a documentary about uh, Jimmy Stewart, not the actor, but the jazz guitarist. Um, Alex Atala is here from Brazil. He is uh, considered one of the uh, top chefs amongst the top chefs of the top chefs in the world. <laughs> um, he is uh, deeply rooted in, uh, in the traditions and cultures of the cuisine of Brazil, but really he's a globally uh, recognized and globally celebrated um, provider of uh, enormous delight in food, gastronomy, nature, life. He is a fisherman, he is a hunter, he is an adventurer, he's an explorer. Um, he spends a lot of time uh, connecting not just the rest of the world to Brazil and its traditions and its food, but Brazilians to their food and their traditions, and particularly uh, to the uh, Amazona region and its uh, areas. And he's a great environmentalist. Um, the restaurant uh, through which he's most known, and um, which uh, I'm not sure what number you are, but is it number six it's now in the world? Anyway, it's one of the very, 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 very <laughs> most uh, like four. toweringly high restaurants on earth, um, is, uh, is called Dom, D-O-M. And uh, he is the, the chef, the owner, the innovator. Um, it is probably the only one in the top 50 where you can eat ants. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he'll tell you about that. Um, he is involved in many other projects uh, around the world and, um, and, and in Brazil. Uh, and we hope that one day we'll be able to eat his food here as well. Nancy Spector is the a deputy director and chief curator of the Brooklyn Museum and was uh, for nearly 30 years before that uh, at the Solomon uh, Guggenheim Museum and Foundation, uh, including a decade which she spent as the deputy director and the Jennifer and David Stockman chief curator. There she organized exhibitions on conceptual photography, 
Felix Gonzalez Torres's work, Matthew Barney's Cree Master Cycle, Richard Prince, Luis Bourgeois, Marina Abramovich, and many others. Uh, she also organized uh, the group exhibitions Moving Pictures, Singular Forms, uh, and the Any Space Whatever. She was the adjunct curator of the 1997 Venice Biennale and co-organizer of the first Berlin Biennale in 1998. Uh, she's written uh, extensively and published and contributed to a great number of books on contemporary artists and is, is really widely recognized and acclaimed as one of the preeminent curators of our time here. So that's who, who's here. Um, we were given this enormous topic, the artist and society, um, which is really a lot, everything. Um, <laughs> I want, a and, and uh, knitting everybody together is going to happen by the way that they, the, the conversations that we have. When, the, when this was organized, I don't think anybody realized that it would be um, such an intense and uh, uh, widely uh, felt uh, anniversary in America. Uh, and I'm not speaking of the first week uh, anniversary of uh, Trump's election as president, which I think is very much on everybody's mind, but it is the 165th anniversary of one of the greatest works of American art, Moby Dick. And um, I once saw a little film about Pablo Casals where he talked about how he plays some Bach every day in the m and he Please. said uh, it's, it's a kind of benediction on the house. So I thought as a kind of benediction on the house I might read a few lines from Moby Dick just to get us started and also to think about the fact that when we talk about the artists in society we talk about a very intense connection to one's moment, one's time and we're all feeling obviously very connected to the moment, wondering what that moment brings. Um, but the way that things get recognized and the way that we find out what actually mattered often takes a long time, uh, which is something I think that uh, everybody's reflected on. And, um, and Moby Dick was virtually uh, unread in its time, unrecognized. Uh, he went back to work at the customs agency downtown at the bottom of Broadway. This is Ishmael in the opening chapter uh, describing why he goes on a whaling voyage. He says, doubtless, my going on this whaling voyage formed part of the grand program of Providence that was drawn up a long time ago. It came in as a sort of brief interlude in solo between more extensive performances. I take it that this part of the bill of the fates must have run something like this. Grand contested election for the presidency of the United States. New headline. Whaling voyage by one Ishmael. Another headline. Bloody battle in Afghanistan. So things change and they don't. <laughs> and, um, and I thought that's something to keep in mind as we also think about like how particularly you know, this moment is one moment versus other moments. And, um, and I thought I would then just read one other little bit that also gets much more broadly at kind of the cosmic dimensions of, of what we think about. And this is a, they're out on the whaling voyage and there is a, a young black boy who's uh, described yeah. as a Negro, uh, his name is Pip, who is on, uh, on the boat and he is the deckhand, he's Ahab's boy on, on the Pequod as they're hunting the whale. And they're whales seen and they lower the boats and they go out to hunt. And it's important to remember that Moby Dick, which we think of as this complicated and abstract book, is also a book about the oil industry. That's what whales were back then. And about the expansion into the Pacific of people from Nantucket uh, looking for oil. And, um, and a whole industry and a whole economy. And Pip uh, is startled when he gets into the boat to go out chasing the whales. He jumps overboard. And they lose, the whale was lost, but Pip was saved. But then Stubb, the master of this whale boat, turns on him and says, stick to the boat, Pip, or by the Lord, I won't pick you up if you jump. Mind that. We can't afford to lose whales by the likes of you. A whale would sell for 30 times what you would in Pip in Alabama. Bear that in mind and don't jump anymore. Hereby, perhaps, Stubb indirectly hinted that though man loved his fellow, yet man is a money-making animal, which propensity too often interferes with his benevolence. But we are all in the hands of gods, and Pip jumped again. <laughs> so he describes this incredibly beautiful sea, and all the boats are off in pursuit of whales, and Pip's, the world is getting bigger around him as he floats. Now in calm weather, to swim in the open ocean is as easy to the practiced swimmer as to ride in a spring carriage ashore. But the awful lonesomeness is intolerable. The intense concentration of self in the middle of such a heartless immensity. My God, who can tell it? Mark how when sailors in a dead calm bathe in the open sea, 
Mark how closely they hug their ship and only coast along her sides. B by the nearest, merest chance, Pip's, Pip's ringed horizon began to expand around him miserably. By the merest chance, the ship itself at last rescued him. But from that hour, the little Negro went about the deck an idiot. Such, at least, they said he was. The sea had jeeringly kept his finite body up, but drowned the infinite of his soul. Not drowned entirely, though. Rather carried down alive to wondrous depths where strange shapes of the unwarped primal world glided to and fro before his passive eyes. And the miser merman, wisdom, revealed his hoarded heaps. And among the joyous, heartless, ever-juvenile eternities, Pip saw the multitudinous god-omnipresent coral insects that out of the firmament of waters heave the colossal orbs. He saw God's foot upon the treadle of the loom and spoke it, and therefore his shipmates called him mad. So man's insanity is heaven's sense, and wandering from all mortal reason, man comes at last to that celestial thought which to reason is absurd and frantic, and Wheeler Woe feels then uncompromised, indifferent as his God. Well, that's Melville, but I thought it's, it's symphonic and wild, um, and I thought maybe we could start Alex, was something you mentioned when we were speaking, which is just that something that's on your mind a lot is disconnection. <laughs> and this, this incredible, you know, this sense like we talk about the artist in society, the artist often is as far out and as abstract as that, that what seems sane is in, s in fact mad, that he has to be quite free and independent. And you said that the sense that people are losing connection to the world around them. Let's first think about our eating and have sex. <laughs> a whole life beings on this planet does. We as a human beings make that the biggest pleasure. In the name of this pleasure, we sometimes forget where they come from and how they have prepared or made it. It's it is not how, how many of us are able to recognize maybe a papaya tree? Not as much. And this does not astonish me. What really astonished me is how many people on the planet Earth are able to recognize an orange tree without the fruit. I'm not talking about a, a, a exotic fruit. I'm talking about something that we have since we have been a kid every day in our lifetime. This is disconnection. Men or people or human beings in the name of the pleasure just disconnected with the food in their primary moment, which is the life. So I do believe that the future cuisine is not teaching people about new toys or new techniques or new flavors. It's just reconnecting us the way that we have been living in producing food. Let's, let's take a, a parallel with the contemporary arts and modern arts. <laughs> <laughs> let's assume that modern art is what we have in the last 50 years. Contemporary art is what you're going to have in the next 50 years. And let's imagine in food. How we have been feeding the world in the last 15 years and the damage or the environmental impact that we have in the last 15 years. And what will be the contemporary food in the next 50 years. Again, feed ourselves. It's something that we did before being human beings. Maybe homo sapiens, maybe before. So reinterpret re the act of eating or cooking or buying. It's very important for the next few years. So again, to make a long history short, I do believe that the future cuisine is not changing people's mind. It's just 
maybe make people buying, eating, and cooking in according to their own values, their own ethics. If we not buy something that we do not agree, this creates a new demand on the market. Big companies are clever enough to understand big demands so we can change the world. Chef's life has changed in the last 20 years. We used to have, sh to have secrets, and we didn't have secrets anymore. Why? We are not angels. We are just bloody human beings with ego, maybe stronger than the others, but human beings. What happened is, in old days, we used to have sec secrets to bring more people from our restaurant. And nowadays, we have uh, social media. So as fast as I, as I find a new recipe or a new trick or a new flavor or a new something, I make that public. And more people see and more people come. Thinking about it, my question is, which is the biggest and strongest and powerful social media that we have nowadays? Maybe you can say Facebook. Okay, Facebook has 1 billion 500, about it, uh, million of, uh, of uh, subscribes. It isn't. What's connect 7 billion on the planet Earth is food. If we achieve to reorganize and re-educate ourselves, this is can have a biggest impact for the future than social media. We waste too much. Maybe we ate too much. We throw away too much. We might respect something that life and nature gives for us, which is food. And Nancy, I want to I actually go to you specifically because here is the, like, the most physically connected of all of us to like just something we all do every day. And you curate contemporary art, some of it quite theoretical or abstract, and it's uh, uh, avant-garde, uh, to use the words. How, how does uh, that world connect to the sort of more earthy world that most people live in? Like, how do you, how do you get that out of the place, or does it matter to it? That how does that influence society in a more direct way than a rather small elite who obviously it, uh, are attuned to it in the first place? Well, the question of the relationship between art and life has been now rehearsed since the f 1950s, if not even before in, in Europe. And I think that continually, or in our present time, artists are really trying to understand how to operate in the real world and, and not exist within the rarefied confines of the museum. But it was something that you were saying that made me think of a project that I did that I would like to think gets at some of the issues, the very issues that you just uh, described. I worked with an artist named Tino Segal, who is a German-born uh, artist who trained in both economics and dance. And he created a mise-en-scene, word you'd used before, um, in the Guggenheim Museum. We had the entire museum. There was not one object in the space. The narrative of the exhibition relied on human conversation. So people would arrive and they would be greeted on the bottom level by children who would ask you what your idea of progress was. You'd walk with them, meet a teenager, the conversation would continue. It would go all the way up until you met with a senior citizen. Behind the scenes there was a dramaturgy that each person who was greeting the visitors had a sense of the conversation, so there was a slightly uncanny quality. It was enormously moving for people. We had over a hundred what we called interpreters that formed a community, but the, the key, the connection that I think with what you were talking about, with I, which I think is very important for us to think about in the art world, is this came from a, a, a deep conviction about sustainability, that the world perhaps does not need any more objects. Now, we can contest that, and I'm not sure I want to <laughs> throw out every 
you know, wonderful artwork that hasn't yet been made. But at that time, it felt really important. This was 2009. And it was a very, very moving artwork that also relied on the oral tradition. And actually, the museum bought that artwork. And it exists merely as an idea, and it can be restaged. And this notion of uh, not using up the world's resources, human energy alone is a work of art. So stop there. You're also very concretely, I mean, your work is representation of reality as you see it at that moment. Uh, and, and working to close. Photography has to go close. And I wonder, at the same time, photography over time is something that many people think that they have some access to, especially now that we all carry better cameras in our pockets than used to be available to most of us ever. I wonder how that has changed or evolved for you over time. And, and in a sense, like what you're, you're more physically in the society in order to make the work. Than, than many other forms of visual representation over time. That goes in the studio. Obviously, you go back to the dark room, but you're there. You're standing next to it when it happens. What's the relationship between that and the final thing, the, the print, the picture? Do people, does that come back? Is that a circle that closes? Uh, it's, you know, it, I'm still, uh, believe it or not, I'm sort of a shy person, right? But to um, address or get near where things are happening, you have to step in there, you know, and. Uh, Everything that, that, that happens to you before you decide you want to be a photographer sort of contributes to that, you know. And, and um, I, I think that uh, with everybody who's a photographer today, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's, it's like there isn't any uh, ethical, you know, looking into what's really going on. You know, it's all surface. Not all the time, but when you get beyond the surface, that's when it gets interesting. That's when you tell stories that should be told. You know, and uh, there's different kinds of ways of doing that, which is, you know, I'm into uh, all kinds of uh, steps of getting to uh, the reality of what's going on. And uh, my first uh, feeling is like, uh, uh, you know, I grew up looking at, like, we are talking Phil Jones Griffith, uh, Don McCullen, you know, people that are doing really interesting uh, things in very difficult places. And, you know, it starts with, uh, well, how do you get to these places? First, you get somebody to give you money enough to go to those places. Then you, you, when you get there, when it's really scary, you get off the plane. And after you get off the plane, you stick around for a while, see what happens. And even if you're, uh, I think, terrified, you know, you have to do that. You have to be there. There's a sense of being there, which there's a movie, Being There, whatever. And <laughs> I mean, to, <laughs> this is the reality. You, you can't, you can't um, uh, to a certain point, you can't talk about it. There's a, a friend of mine, we were talking to a friend, another friend who was describing uh, this photography he wanted to do. He wanted to do this, he was describing it so well. And then we looked at each other and, and, and we were shaking our heads because he was not getting the place near that place. And you couldn't explain to him how to walk, you know, one step at a time, just relax, take a deep breath, you know, and relax. You know, there's all kinds of ways of doing that. And today, since this world is brought together by Facebook and Internet, it's, it's, uh, you can do so many things to connect on so many different levels. I talk to a lot of uh, people I'm mentoring uh, all over the world. Some people I still haven't met yet. There's like one person in, in, uh, in Saigon you know, who lives there who's from Taiwan. I'm going to meet finally in December <laughs> in, in the Cambodia. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, there's uh, people, a lot of people like that, but they're interested in, in seeing things um, where they're at. And what, what does it mean? How do I, how do I describe that? Mm -hmm. And I explained to him, uh, too, it's not just, not just taking a photograph. You've got to write about it you know, for yourself. You don't have to write it to anybody else. But write to yourself and be honest. Um, drawing, painting, which I still, I still do, and music. All these different concepts come together. And uh, what I like to do when something's really uh, sort of stupid, <laughs> or call it that, or or even dangerous or something like that, put ear, you know, my music in my ear and start listening to music mm -hmm. as I'm walking around and people seem to ignore you or else they figure you're in this blessed space and so, yeah, let go, let them do that. But uh, whatever it takes to get to those places, and even if somebody doesn't want to be photographed, um, saying that, well, what the hell are you doing here? It's like, you know, 
well, this is what I'm trying to do. I explain what I'm doing or what I'm trying to do. And if they still don't want to do it, like, let me take for a cup of coffee, you know, and talk, you know, that kind of thing. There's all that connection. I was told when I went to, um, uh, just when I went to Lebanon, that you're going to see things that are, that are really amazing and you're not going to be able to photograph them. But that, that only happened maybe once. And that was like because the, um, uh, maybe twice at the most. And that's because in one case, it was, uh, the hospital got hit, mm -hmm. got hit. And the, the uh, director of the hospital came out and found there's an American out there and started screaming at me. And I said, I, you know, I, I emphasize with you, he's able to speak English. And I said, I, I worked in the hospital for a long time myself, you know, and I'm not happy about it. But then that started, that happened because a certain other thing was going on. So we had a, a brief conversation, but he calmed down and we realized I wasn't joking around when I was serious about it, you know. There's always, there's always a way to communicate if you want to really do it. If, you're, if you want to just, you know, like uh, window shopping, you take a picture, okay, that's good enough, so leave. That's not good enough. It's never good enough. It's if I say something, uh, I go someplace. And we're going someplace with a group of people, you know, and, the, and you see something going on and said, no, that's amazing. Oh, we'll catch it on the way back. That means it's not going to happen. It's like the train left the station and you missed it, you know, mm -hmm. and you're going to keep missing it if you take on it. You have to have the courage, I think, to go forward. It's not talking about courage because I'm going to be brave, but courage enough to um, try to defy your things where I'm bored or I don't think that's the interest. I'm not sure. I'm this. You're making all kinds of excuses when you have to step into the, into the, into the middle of things, mm -hmm. you know, in a serious way. And the, the funny thing is children are the best ways of doing that because they don't care. Children? Yeah, they yeah. think I'm a big giant that can, you know, can climb all over, you know, whatever. Right. And, and uh, that gets interesting. And actually, uh, times when um, there, there's something that's going to happen to me and my two friends that's going to be very bad. And but because of my, my translator who is uh, from Los Angeles, he was like just totally fearless. I don't think he even understand the idea of danger. And because these kids were curious about me, they'd never seen a black guy before, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I'm sort of playing games with them, you know, like sticking my tongue at them and stuff like that. But then these guys that were going to kill us all of a sudden let us go. I mean, in fact, they took us in the barracks where they were stationed at. And, I mean, but all that communi thing is communication in some way or form. And you don't know what's going to be the, the venue that's going to work for you at a particular time. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I mean, I, I think that's... That idea of having to be able to walk into the midst of things, it's obviously quite different as our, when, you're, when you're writing about, not just writing, but about reading. You're writing about the world, but you're also about writing about encountering it. And at the beginning of your, your book, Republic of the Imagination, you describe this encounter, which is really about this question of connection, where you're, you're giving a talk. Is it in Seattle or Portland? Seattle. Seattle at Elliott Bay. Yeah, Elliot and, you're, Bay. and you're at this bookstore, and, and basically somebody comes up to you at the end of the talk and says, uh, who's Iranian, and, and who sort of says, like, these people, they don't really get it, I mean, in a sense. Yeah. And, uh, and you resist that. And uh, I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about what that, that, that feeling that where, where people who read books often, we like to think that what one's creating is some sort of community of readers, but mm -hmm. at the same time, they often look at each other as if they're not really getting it. They're not drawing close enough to it. They're not sort of um, getting that physical uh, contact that we're talking mm -hmm. about. Yes, that um, incident you talk about, um, there was this young guy in, in the line waiting for the autographs, and when he came to me, he said, I don't have any books for you to sign. And uh, he said, um, you're wasting your time. These people, and by these people, he meant Americans. He said, they don't care the way we did about books. Um, Xeroxing hundreds of pages of Madame Bovary or um, Huckle Huckleberry Finn. And that sort of stayed with me. I felt that the answer I gave him was not really sufficient. And you have to understand where he's coming from and where I was coming from when I returned to America in 1999. Um, and to make the story short, I just tell you an anecdote. Uh, I had a student, um, the first year I taught in, at the uh, university in Tehran, um, she was um, uh, sort of, what do you say nowadays, a practicing Muslim. Uh, she wore the veil all her life. She came from very um, poor family. Her mother was a washerwoman. And um, in my class, she fell absolutely in love with Henry James. 
I mean James, Daisy Miller, and um, Catherine of Washington Square just sort of took, uh, sort of uh, took Razier by the storm, yeah, and. and I ask, were you reading them in English or in translation? We were reading them in English. Uh -huh. Islamic right. Republic of Iran. We right. were reading I them assumed, in English. But, yeah. And I tell you, I, I, I feel that um, achievements uh, of any nation, once they, are, they come out into the world, they belong to the whole world, but they specifically belong to those who appreciate them who make them theirs. And I felt that Razier, more than many of my students here in the United States, or many of my colleagues here in the United States, had made Henry James her own. Uh, but uh, Razier was also, people don't believe that these people in a place like Iran, they not only kill seculars and Jews and Christians and atheists, but they kill a lot of people who are Muslims. And Razier was against the regime. So at the very beginning of the revolution, it was um, she was arrested. And I never saw her after they closed down the universities. Years later, another student of mine who had been in jail with Razier um, told me that she was executed. But those days they spent together in their cells. They were talking Henry James and Scott Fitzgerald, you know? And, 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 you know, the question comes to me time and again, why would a girl like Razier, at the moment when she's encountering the absoluteness of death, the only thing she's, talk she's thinking about is Henry James. And, and you see this in all sorts of other cultures. You see this when Primo Levi, after coming out of the concentration camp, talks about teaching Dante to his French cellmate was more important to him than his daily ration of bread. Well, anyway, I just remember James Baldwin. He's my latest beau, and every time I think of him, I, I sort of have goosebumps. Um, and Baldwin talking about the fact that he felt so, he also loved. Henry James, by the way. Um, and, 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 and he talks about how you feel so lonely. And then you read a guy named Dostoevsky. And you realize that you know, your hearts beat to the same pulse. So the whole idea of fiction, the reason people react like this to, to works of imagination is because, as Mark Twain says, it is an affair of the heart. You know, he talks about um, Huckleberry Finn, that it is a book about um, the conflict between a sound heart and a deformed conscience in which the heart wins. And heart, on the surface, Huck is a racist, but because of his interaction with Jim, he's resurrected through the eyes of Jim. Jim is the first one who sees Huck. And, and Huck cannot betray him because he says, I imagined Jim in the morning and I imagined Jim. And, and those others in the book, they are blind. Their hearts are closed. They don't see Jim as a father. Uh, so anyway, to make this long story short and go back to Iran and <laughs> shut up after that, um, what I wanted to say is that that young man came from that sort of an environment where people, where people went to jail for reading books and where our connection to the world, we couldn't come here, we were closed off from the world, but our real connection was through its golden ambassadors, uh, from uh, Baldwin to Melville, I love his confidence man, by the way. Mm. I think these days, confidence man should be read for reasons that will remain um, unsaid. Obvious. Obvious. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But anyway, so people immediately, what I discovered in Iran, and I'm thankful to the Islamic Republic for it, was that immediately when y you are deprived of your rights in reality, you turn to works of imagination and ideas. It is almost instinctive that people go towards, uh, towards literature and, and, and arts. And, and 
what really, the first thing that disenchanted me when I came back to US was like that young boy, I felt that these people <laughs> don't, don't, appreciate it don't appreciate it. And if it weren't for my travels to red states and blue states and the ones in between to talk about books and to see all these amazing people, I don't know whether they were Republican or Democrat. That's the whole thing about Republic of Imagination. You know, you, you um, transcend every single limitation that uh, reality forces on you. Uh, nationality, language, race, religion, class, gender, all of this is transcended. And uh, so um, that is how I started. And uh, I realized that he was fortunately wrong and I was wrong. We were both just reacting. Um, and that um, I hope now in these hard times, we'll go back to our roots, which is imagination and ideas. Uh, I mean, it makes, it makes me think of something you were talking about when earlier when we were talking about talking tonight, Eli, and that is just, um, well, that you started out thinking about painting, that you wanted to be a painter, which is much more, in a sense, a direct channel to imagination than going straight up and taking pictures, which obviously has a lot of imagination, but also has a lot of unmediated contact in it. And, and also that when you got started as a photographer, uh, the race bar was high, that people didn't want to hire you because you were black mm -hmm. and, um, in the 70s. And, and that yet sort of on some level was, obviously it was a huge hurdle, but it was also, you said it just meant, okay, I accept, I, I, I recognized that and went about my business. You also said, uh, in regards to uh, the current moment, well, I'll bet a lot of really good art's gonna come out of this, or a lot of really interesting stuff's gonna come out of this. So, I mean, I've sometimes wondered whether, you know, during the Soviet period, everybody was reading all these novels from Prague, and I thought, look, we've got totalitarian envy in our free society. You know, they all wanna be in a free society, and we all wanna be more repressed to make better art. And, 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 and I thought that, we, you know, that we, that we sort of think, well, that's the real stuff. You know, if only I could go to jail like Dostoevsky and almost get executed and then not get <laughs> executed, you know. That, and, and, um, but that's not really what anybody wants to have happen to them. Yeah. So maybe you can just talk a little bit about how that imagination worked for you. Well, you know, it's, it's like a, a litmus test. Um, I mean, the litmus test is always coming out there. I mean, like somebody gets elected when, you know, says, oh, they're not going to get elected. And they get elected, you know. What does it mean? Uh, uh, the thing is, if you get uh, sidetracked, you'll never get any work done because you'll be paying attention to people tell you, oh, you should do this, you should do that. Really? Why don't you do that? Why don't you do this? I mean, I, I, I can't even, uh, I don't even bother talking with people a lot of times when I get into that because it's, it's a waste of time. Because, it's, you know, it's a voyage of discovery just it, within yourself first because people say, oh, I want to make photographs, I want to make great art because they want to save the world, you know, and that's a lie. They want to save themselves first. They want to deal with that inside your head, what's really going on. So the, the thing is that you, you got to get past that. Like I told you, I just started an electric violin and the guitar thing. Well, because it's uh, something to push me, something that uh, I like music and see what happens. But it's always within the self, that in your understanding what's right, what's wrong, whether you can make yourself go in that direction. I mean, you try it, you, you see what happens, and you, you have to ignore, if you're, you know, I, I close off a lot when I'm, I'm, I'm hearing everything, but I close up all this stray nonsense that's going on, including people. Actually, uh, once I photographed something, and something, what happened? Oh, yeah, three different attempts to hit me with, with batons, and I never noticed because I was moving in a certain kind of motion, something I learned from my Aikido movement. Mm -hmm. I was moving around a certain way, and they kept on missing and by the time they, they you know, they were, they, I think they started watching me after a while. How did he do that? I wasn't paying attention to that. I was just mm -hmm. going in the way I thought would work. And, and I got, you know, I got the pictures I needed to get from what was going on. It's, it's always that way, whether it's a quiet moment, um, like I'm directing this movie, and um, your subjects and documentaries can be interestingly interesting, let's put it that way. And the thing is, I had to, again, calm myself down, and I just, Relax, do what you can do. And it was under stressful situation. But I did, in spite of having the man, not one, but three cameras, really, um, at the time, setting up and supervising the sound and a lot of that kind of stuff, 
I managed to make some pictures I really liked, you know, which I didn't even notice until I think actually yes, two, two days ago. Two days ago, I, and this was done about a month ago. So I mean, the thing, it, the other thing is that um, I think Joseph Padelka, he doesn't necessarily look at his pictures for a long time after he makes the photographs, you know, and then he, he finally gets into, he has his little books and things like that, but he doesn't really look at them. I'm, I'm constantly looking at all the photographs I've made, uh, particularly black and white images, because that was then, you know, you're going by instinct to do something, to get someplace. And then later you look at, holy God, how did I do that? I don't even, I don't even remember making a photograph. I don't even remember thinking, you know, because I was trying to calm the inner self down, not to think about it, just to get in there and experience whatever is going to happen. Hopefully it's not going to happen to you that's going to hurt you, but, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I've done a lot of things that were that way. You'd never know if I'm looking at the pictures because I didn't get hit by the baton. Mm -hmm. I kept on moving. And uh, that whole thing today, I think that, um, so much really bad stuff is going on right now on both sides. And I think that you're going to separate uh, the men from the boys and the uh, women from the children, the girls, because, you know, they make images that mean something. If there's so many photographs coming out there that mean nothing, it's like you forget it. You basically forget it. But I think this is a time for people who have uh, a will and uh, understanding of what's at, at uh, what's possible here. You have to get in there and do it. And I know some people, I mentioned to you before, or was one, uh, one person that's doing some interesting stuff that way, and he's, he's been going for it for a while. It's not something new. But now the time's come to burst open and to do it. That's the way it works. I mean, I think this is something that comes up constantly when people talk about, you know, on the one hand, artists are responding to their society. On the other hand, artists are constantly trying to uh, remain independent from the society, not be steered by it, remain sort of sufficiently indifferent to the pressures of the moment and of the society and its expectations. And that comes up for you. I mean, you talk about just sort of saying, I'm going to do this thing nobody's heard of before. Uh, I'm going to bring things that people say, well, you should have a French restaurant, or you should have a this, or you should do that, or you shouldn't eat insects, or you shouldn't go to the Amazon, or nobody even knows about it. What, what is that about for you? How does that... Uh well, let's, let's think about... Insects. Let's start by, by this. Exactly. Maybe we couldn't imagine that eating insects was a kind of color that nobody likes to paint, but it exists. Eating insects can be disgusting, according for our culture. Eating insects can be disgusting as open a strawberry yogurt and gave to your kid. The red color of strawberry, it isn't from the strawberry. <laughs> it's from cochonilla, which is an insect. But again, our culture said that eating insects is not <laughs> It's disgusting. We don't need this. We don't need vomit. Vomit is disgusting, no? Please, can you tell me what is honey? Vomit. Whoa, oh, please. <laughs> it does seem like this. Something that has been introduced in your daily life since you was a kid is a set ball. Review our relation with food. It is mandatory for the future. But... Our mental blocks are so strong sometimes. Let's think about this beautiful smell of barbecue. This only humans does this. No other animal knows this. But other animals, when they felt this beautiful smell of barbecue, they come because they know that's good food. Even vegetarian peoples, when they felt this <laughs> aroma, it's it's sexy. <laughs> oh yeah. It's it's it's, it's good. It's I mean it's, it's vegetarians it, I know always say I love that if they slip if they slip it's bacon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the first, that's, like the, that's the gateway drug for vegetarians to go back to meat. It's super intense smell and flavor. Uh, uh, science can explain this beautiful aroma of, uh, of barbecue. It's called Meyer reaction. It's a reaction between fat, protein, and temperature. 
Okay? So science explains this. Once we know what is this beautiful aroma and the science can expand, I would like to invite you guys to make with me a mental trip. Let's travel. If I tell you soy sauce, ginger, um, seaweed, our minds can go to Japan. If I tell you tomato, mozzarella, uh, basil, we can go for other parts. Of it. But let's do something different. Maybe beyond. Let's go to Nepal. Let's take 15 days praying, doing meditation, eating vegetables, and put our body and our mind in harmony. And we will be maybe more harmonic people. After 15 days, we start to walking back for our daily life. And we felt this beautiful aroma of barbecue. And this is teasing us. So let's go eat a barbecue. We deserve 15 days <laughs> meditating. Come on. <laughs> and we go. When we arrive in that barbecue place, what is happening there is not a real barbecue. It is a ceremony, a phenomenal, a, 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 a cultural phenomenon or cultural ritual from Nepal, which is a dead man being burned. My reaction is fire, temperature, or temperature, protein, and fat. I have three, three kids, two boys. As a Brazilian, guys, they love soccer. And they go play soccer every day. And then they went back home and take out the sneakers. And it's fun how the socks smells exactly the cheese that I work it. <laughs> <laughs> we might you understand this. Image and flavor, image and aroma can bring you different sensations from the same subject. This is something that only exists in your head, not in the nature. Mm. We understand this can maybe make us understand better the way that we have been cooking and eating the last 15 days, 15 years, sorry. We can I'm a, I prefer to see a half glass of water mm -hmm. as an almost full glass of water. Okay? I do believe that the future food, it's possible. The power of a human beings adapted of new situations, it's huge. But we can keep producing food or eating food or wasting food as we did nowadays, or, or we are dozen. Now we dozen, sorry, mm. nowadays. Uh, uh, reconnecting with maybe the way that our grandfathers used to produce it food and cooking can be the future. People said that um, natural conservation. Yes, we might understand that our natural resources are not infinite, and we might take care of them. Water, lands, rivers, but protecting or natural conservation is not, is, is not, it isn't protect the river, the sea, or the lands. It's protect the man who lives in there. Mm -hmm. And food chain in that moment can be a so powerful weapon. Why? Because everybody does. Simple like this. We might understand this. What is creativity? Creativity is not do something that nobody does. It's do something that everybody does in an unexpected way. What is innovation? Innovation is creativity more utility. So let's imagine this with a cell phone. Cell phone is an old idea. A very old idea. Batman used to have <laughs> in his belt a cell phone. This is not a new idea. It's an old idea. In the 80s, I went to the first time for an office and I saw a facsimile machine. And that for me was Jet Jetson's thing. I mean, I, I, was, I was under Hanna-Barbera world. 
<laughs> the fax machine was fascinating, it was spectacular. Question, what is most innovative? Cellular phone or fax family? How many of us has a fax machine at home? How many of us has your cell phone with you? We might you understand this. If we does, if we do, this can be the new way to do. Simple like this. So, so when you're doing, when you're making exhibitions for people, you're obviously taking people who are out there on their own, making things, trying to, as he says, do things that people have done before, but in ways that nobody's done them. I mean, they're not simply, <laughs> they're reinventing the wheel. They're not inventing the wheel for the most part. Um, and, and, and you're trying to sort of take those people out of that solitude and make the connection to a larger audience. What, what's, how does that work? How does the, that particular uh, aspect of it work? And, and how, do you, how does that not, in a sense, normalize what isn't, you know, what, what, what's solitary or, or make it, mm -hmm. how do you avoid making conventional what's been unconventional by just simply taking it to many, many people? It's a very interesting question. I think that the role of a curator is an odd combination of being a producer, a facilitator, an innovator. We're not artists, but I think it's necessary that we can understand the future in the sense of extrapolating forward to um, anticipate how an audience could or would react to a body of work that you've selected to show. and. The kinds of exhibitions that I've done and the work I've been drawn to primarily are ones that really engage the viewer and, and push the limits and ask a lot of questions about what is an artwork. So they're not traditional paintings on the wall, sculptures in the center of a room. Um, I work with contemporary art, so of course that, that's somewhat implicit that the artists themselves are questioning that, but I think that looking back at my track record at the Guggenheim, um, artists who take a form and completely, a form that we recognize. So um, Felix Gonzalez Torres, a, a, an artist who unfortunately died in the mid 90s from AIDS, had a whole notion of subversiveness through beauty. So he created uh, sculptures that were, um, replenishable in that everyone could help themselves. They were comprised of stacks of paper with photographs or captions, and people could help themselves to this, and the, the stacks would diminish, they would be refilled. This, of course, was the height of the AIDS crisis, so there was a rehearsal of loss, there was an incredible melancholy in the work, but also a joy in that you could take this work and have it, it was yours, and you could go home and draw on it or, or tack it up on the wall. He also made these enormous spills of candy. And for those people who are familiar with minimalism, the stacks look like Donald Jubb boxes, the spills look like post-minimalist scatter works. But for me, the most important thing, and I think it's something that I try to get at all of my projects, is that there was content. So it wasn't just this disruption of form, but there were always, every, all the works were untitled, but each one had an, a subtitle, and they dealt with same-sex love, they dealt with the loss of health insurance at the time, they dealt with the encroachment of the, what at that time we called the Christian right. And in some ways, I've been thinking about this work because it was incredibly prescient. He had one stack of paper called Republican Years that was taken, it was a what, big sheets of white paper with a black border, completely empty. And it was taken from an Austrian uh, funeral announcement that you would buy the card and fill in. So that stack was made in 1992. So I make a show that looks like minimalist sculpture. And this was also the height of the culture wars. And to introduce narrative that wouldn't necessarily be fundable or shown in a major institution at that time. I think things have changed, certainly, and more museums have become radicalized, if you will, but I really look for art that will, to some extent, confuse people when they come, because they don't really know how, how do you relate to a completely empty museum. What is this pile of candy? Can I take it? 
how much should I take, what does it mean? So the experience is altered, and then hopefully through that seduction and confusion, there are really serious messages. And I continually look for artists who operate in that realm to different ends. But. I wanted to mention, by the way, and you'll see, Speaking of exhibitions, um, the art in this room, which is um, the artist is uh, Maria Papadimitriou, and the, the title is Laboratory Antigone. They've been having at the uh, here at the Anassis uh, Foundation a, a whole series of uh, uh, programs regarding Antigone, and um, it's inspired. Uh, these 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 images are inspired by an old tannery works. Those are hides with the names of the main characters there, and. And as I was seeing this, and we were looking around at it earlier, I was reminded of being uh, not, of, not of Antigone, but of uh, Prometheus Bound. You mentioned fire, and that we're the only ones with it. And um, uh, when I was a, a kid, we were on vacation in Greece uh, when I was about, well, it was 1973. Doesn't matter how old I was. And, um, and it was the summer. Uh, and it was uh, some, we, were, we were staying somewhere on an island, and, and anyway, the word was that we could catch a little ferry and go to Ephesus and see at the old amphitheater at Ephesus this production of um, Prometheus Bound. And, and uh, the, this happened to be at the point where the, uh, this was, we didn't know it yet, but it was right at the sort of climax of the, of the junta at that moment and the military dictatorship of, that was uh, about to topple. Uh, and so this play, which is all about basically tyranny and, and bondage, uh, was being done in a classical production in this ancient amphitheater. And as we sat there, as the dusk falls and it gets dark enough to have the play, all of a sudden there's this like w big flashing blue lights and sirens and a big motorcade comes in and these police all get out and they walk basically backwards in a row like this, pushing the entire amphitheater back like four rows and out comes a substantial chunk of the junta and their uh, entourage to come to the theater. <coughs> you know, not only Abe Lincoln had a dramatic night at the theater, so <laughs> it was, you know, you, it was quite incredible. And then it gets dark and then there's this play and, it's in, and they pl act it incredibly passionately and out of the darkness, people start shouting. Um, you know, freedom and various things in response to the play. Very, you know, one word. You don't want to be detectable. And, and it was very intense. It was also like, talk about the role of art. Never mind the artist in society. The artist had been dead for about 2,000 years. Um, the play was at least in its language, but it was as alive as could be. And yet at the time that it was being written, it was already about ancient myths or virtually ancient myths. They were alive, but they were from a period lost to the mists and the ages. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it had this incredibly strong uh, moment. I'm sort of wondering, like, what would that be now? <laughs> uh, you talked about sort of the, the question of people who feel it, you know, in the way that you would feel that Henry James is your lifeline in prison. It's almost like a martyrdom for Henry James. You know, something where a, a work of art that is not agitprop, uh, although it's pretty blunt in its messages, but it's also mythical and abstract. Transformative. Um, huh? Transformative. Yes, yep. totally transformative and transformed from whatever it was at that time mm -hmm. to this thing uh, takes yeah. place. And, and well, actually I've been how would we know it? thinking about Antigone a lot since we came here and they were talking uh. about it. And um, that is really the miraculous thing about great art, how it connects to the past, reveals the present, and at the same time predicts the future. And, and, and one of the most important things it does is create a continuity. So we as human beings have felt the way, um, we don't know anything about uh, Aeschylus or Euripides or uh, any of them, but have felt someone has felt 2,000 years ago right into the present. And I was thinking about popular um, uh, wor works of art. I was watching uh, Boston Legal. As one does. <laughs> well, yeah, I watch also Simpsons and Law and Order. Uh, I love them. And, and anyway, I was watching Boston Legal, and there was this episode where this young woman um, is uh, taken to court because her mother has given her father's body, her father was an alcoholic, and so she's given the body of the husband to, uh, to be shown, uh, to be put on show to see 
what alcohol does to you. So it's for the good of you know uh, the people. And the girl thinks that this desecrates the memory and integrity of her father. And the whole episode is around this choice that you have to make between preserving the integrity of your father or doing something which is called for public good. You know, and I thought, ha, huh, Antigone, <laughs> you know, here she comes. Because the whole point is that most probably the person who wrote it, directed it, they didn't know anything, or they did. I don't know about Antigone. But there is this connection. And I think that is what is so important about, uh, about art. And, and then there is the connection, uh, like, for example, I have thought about this a lot. And it first occurred to me when I went to Rome. and. Um, and the Ark of Severius, they have in stone one of their Persian captives, you know. And, and in Persia, uh, we have the Emperor Valerian, whom we conquered, who is um, in stone, and he's bending, and the King Shahpur is putting his feet on him to mount his horse. And, and, and I thought, OK, these three empires, Greeks, Romans, and Persians, they were at it, burning one another, having just a ball, you know. And um, yet, you look, you go to Freer Sackler or you go to Met, and you look at the art. Persians, Romans, Greeks, these are intimate enemies because there, they are so alike, you know. And, and, and so, art takes you to a different domain. And, and it takes you to a domain that, like Shahrazad, taking you from the domain of the king to the domain of the stories. And, and, and that language is the language she speaks, which the king has to learn to speak in order to be healed. And the two other things I wanted to say about this, I feel that imagination is important not because it resists a uh, political system. Resistance in great works of art um, is existential. It is not political. And that is why, as James Baldwin says, artists are here to disturb the world. You know, they're constantly posing us as question marks. And, they are, and, and the reason I think that art is important for our survival is two things. The main pillars of imagination are curiosity. And Nabokov used to tell his students, curiosity is in subordination in its purest form. You know? Because would curiosity, human beings had to survive. In order to survive, they had to know. And that almost sensual urge that you talk about food, that urge to want to know, to touch, to feel, to smell, um, to taste, that helps you through science to understand the natural world and control it and change it, and through imagination to know those intimate strangers, that world outside of you. That inarticulate feeling, you talk, we talk about, as you asked her about abstract art, there is something inarticulate that needs to be articulated. And when you first read a poem or you look at a painting, you don't understand it. You feel it. You respond to it with something that has nothing to do with it. So it is first curiosity, coming out of yourself, wanting to become the other. And I'm not using it in the academic sense. I hate what the academics have done to the concept of the other. You know, it's just really, really trashy. So um, you want to become the other. You are the Alice who is running after the white rabbit, you know, and not knowing what happens when she jumps down at that hole. And the second thing, which is a word that nowadays is being so misused, is empathy. Because through empathy, you would not only celebrate difference, and in this country we put too much emphasis on difference. Difference is what those people are doing when they're writing racist slurs on 
on, on the walls today in, in America when you are saying that these people are different from us, you know, and therefore we can do anything to them. So you celebrate difference, the uniqueness, but at the same time, it is the shock of recognition. It is what the Bart said, the question, if you prick us, do we not bleed? Because we all bleed. The mother in Iraq, whose son is taken away from her by a bomb, she bleeds. The woman in Afghanistan who's taken to a football stadium and a gun is put to her head because of the way she's dressed, she bleeds. And the woman in New Orleans whose house has been taken away from her by a hurricane or Trevon Martin's mother, they all bleed. You know, and once you understand that we share the best and the worst, and that is only through imagination and ideas, then maybe you will become more compassionate. Uh, not politically correct, but compassionate. I think being compassionate is different. No. Maybe I can, just because we have so many things to touch on here, but I want to ask for a second just about sort of the relationship between all of that and power. In other words, so I mentioned this, this production in the theater and how powerful it was to see these actors enacting this thing with these uh, military leaders in, in present. And then, at the end, as everybody starts to cheer and applaud, again, the cops are on their feet and they backed up a little bit, pushing the crowd back. And as the actors came out to bow, these military leaders went in to, give, to shake their hands and embrace them. And now, we didn't know what the relationship was, who these actors were, or what their political stories were, but one felt a fair amount of tension, <laughs> you know, at the very least, um, to, to suddenly go from having stirred up this incredible passion to then being congratulated and have the ribbon put on you, you know? And th there's this great line um, in James Agee where he says, you know, we all think about the things that are so beautiful and sublime and delightful in art, but, you know, he says, lie down on the floor, take the uh, this was in the late 50s or early 60s. Take the biggest pair of speakers you can get your hands on, put them on either side of your head, and play Beethoven's seventh at the top volume. Um, and then tell me how pretty it is, you know? And, and, how, and how, like, you know, you put on your suit and go there and, and, and quietly relax <laughs> after work to Beethoven. He said, you know, the, the greatest um, sort of brutality that you can do, he said, is to do fury honor. Like, it's this... There's this rage and this fury and this attention, and then power comes along and subdues it, or power comes along and a comet, you know, puts its arm around you. How does that work? I mean, you're, you're, you're taking a picture of something that's, that's um, saying like, whoa, look at this. Look what's happening. Look at these relationships between people. And then, and then they say, well, here it is on the front page of the paper, and the paper sort of tells people what's happening, and it calms you down, and we flip the page, and the next day it's something else. <laughs> How does one keep that fury hot? Well, I can start with the world as a chaos, right? Chaos, and we live in this, uh, this quiet storm, you know? And, um, and so, to me, like, uh, a large part of the artist uh, makes, is working to make some sense out of this chaos. Uh, where does it, where does it uh, place you? Where does it put you uh, to view this thing? And, and, and uh, quiet outrage comes out if you do it right, if you really work it, you're not you know, even think about politics or anything else, but how something's going down. This is the reality of what's what's happening. I keep on coming back to the reality thing because that's what I live in, yeah. you know? And, uh, um, but there's a lot of that in great art, you know? And th that's the thing, it, it makes you, you don't you don't leave it really, it, st it sticks with you. If you take a picture that uh, that's really good, or, or a lot of them, hopefully, you know, they stay with you, they don't go away. That's why you go see a therapist, things like that, you know. So um, I think that uh, if you're smart, uh, I think it's, an, it's just important that um, you understand what you're going into, you know. There's, um, it's like this firestorm that's waiting for you. And now are you going to step in? Or, or it's a simpler way to think, are you in or are you out, you know. And uh, once you decide that, you don't, there's no thinking about it. Just go into it. But it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean anything about violence or something like that. But... It's really taking the world at, at its uh, what's what's going on in it, not walking away, just you know, just taking a good look, and trying to make sense out of it. And that's the hardest thing because 
often, so I mean, to sort of mentioned that a little bit before, you don't necessarily know when you, when you, ha when you have it. Uh, when I was uh, first with the Beirut, uh, Magnum and uh, Philip, Philip said he was looking at pictures, I guess, uh, telex, uh, just try to take one good picture a day, you know? And, and the thing is, you don't know when you've taken that picture, but you keep on working and as hard as you can, you know? And, and you just uh, see what happens later. And I, was, I wasn't able to see anything for a couple of months, you know, because I'm there and you the film is going back, you know, and that kind of thing. So, but it's a good lesson because um, uh, sometimes you might, at the end of the day, you might stop into a place. I'm just using this one place of reference, but stare at the, stare at the wall and, you, and you, you're reviewing what you're looking at on the wall, what you've seen, what you managed to capture, what you missed. And you know, you know you missed something and you're really ticked off for the rest of your life, maybe, you know. But that's part of the deal. You know, it's, it's uh, always trying to get your hands on that, on the, uh, the craziness that you see or, or the quiet beauty of what you see. You know, and those, they, they keep fighting with you. Maybe if you're, if you're lucky or not unlucky for the rest of your life because it's in your head. When you go to sleep, that's what's there. When you wake up, that's the first thing you see, so. I mean, you come out of punk rock, right? And then you come, you come from punk rock into like serving meals that are like perfect to people who are paying quite a bit for it and in a really nice, <laughs> this is, this elegant, is my point. in an I elegant place. But you're doing it with a certain kind of energy that you're still drawing off that juice. So what, like how do those things work together? How does that? Let's, for, let's understand food. If I go, w what is expensive? What can be understand expensive? Maybe if you go for a, a burger and someone g s gave to you a tiny burger. <laughs> when you go for a burger, you want to bite. You want to <laughs> eat your hands. It's very primary. <laughs> eat with your hands. Big piece. What I do? Small pieces of dressing good food on a big dish. If I go for a sushi bar or for, 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 a, for, a, for, a, for a burger and someone gave me a tiny burger, this is gonna disappoint me. Maybe the only thing that can disappoint me more than a small burger is a giant sushi. <laughs> 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 we might understand this when you go for food. Right. Size, comfort is the key. Let's imagine how was. No, I mean, I was wondering <laughs> about that small bag. It was so <laughs> <laughs> very tasty that it melts in your mouth type of a thing. But <laughs> I mean, this is just a way to provoke it. But let's think about uh, luxury. My profession on a 67th was wasn't a fancy and cool profession. Yeah. When does it start to change? Maybe in the eights, when the good guy who was working in maybe Wall Street could have a big car, an expensive pen, a fancy watch, a signed costume, <coughs> dating a model, go for a French restaurant, knows the chef and take a wine. That was the, the guy. <laughs> and this was the rise up of our beautiful fine dine scene. What is luxury nowadays? We have another phenomenon, which may be s internet. In the 80s, maybe I couldn't be here wearing sneaks or you jeans. You that was that was maybe not acceptable. So internet bring bring us some comfort, some relaxing, some authenticity. This is changing the food in the, this is changing also food chain. What is luxury nowadays? It's not paying pay lots of money. Even if we know that white truffles or a big burger in the wine or it's good and expensive. I'm not questioning on it. But we want relaxing, enjoying and be comfortable. 
food thing might re-understand ourselves. And maybe it's much more, can be much more luxury. Enjoy a moment with the friends, then have an awesome wine and the amazing food <laughs> with no pleasure. That's thinking about uh, the, act, the, act, the real act to feed ourselves. What you put in your mouth. People said more different things. You ate better is for your health, more colorful your dish, stronger you will be. So let's think about biodiversity. Biodiversity, when you talk about biodiversity, there's no value. When you eat biodiversity, can has a value. Maybe it's difficult to understand this in the world, but let's take an example. 20 years ago, we used to drink just few wine from few regions of the world. Nowadays, we drink wines from all over the world. To understand wine, we try to understand geography, geology, climate, and different types of grapes. This is biodiversity. More we eat, more open is our palate, more open or wide can be our diet, better from the planet, health for you, stronger can be your body and your mind. That's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about pleasure for a second. <laughs> I mean, yes. because well there like is it. also <laughs> this notion. There is this notion that you know, earnest or serious works or <laughs> artists who are sort of pushing the limits of society and so forth are are somehow demanding and this and and, and so forth. But of course, what your students who are responding to Henry James or who are reading these other things, they're getting enormous pleasure out of it. Uh, yeah. People who are looking at a photograph that you took uh, of uh, Beirut. Mm. Yeah. It might not be direct. They're not saying like, you know, well, I'm so happy seeing that war picture. But they might be having some, you know, they're having an aesthetic and intellectual and communal, or c they're communing with it, right? At some level that gives them pleasure, otherwise they will look away. And, and I think the perfect example, I sometimes, you know, because when you write about horrible things and people say, well, I've had people say, well, I enjoyed reading what you wrote. Well, I don't want to say I enjoyed it. And they're like, well, I do want you to enjoy it. Of course I want you to enjoy it. You know, I don't want to aestheticize it, meaning like take away its power but, uh, and make it pretty or cute or kitschy. But that question, it seems really important. Like how the pleasure, do you, do you think about that when you're making it or do you only see it afterwards when you later say, oh, that's a good one? I don't think about necessarily when I'm making it unless it's something funny going on. I'm right. just going to make sure I But I remember um, uh, there's um, uh, somebody wrote a, a Beirut book about um, um, this Lebanese man who looked at uh, pictures and he started crying. And said, after a while, he said, this is the Lebanon I know. And then there's a, a woman who I met who's a uh, makeup artist on a movie. And she, um, she, uh, she said, I heard, I heard you did this book in Lebanon. And when she started crying, but, and and she's, I, said, I told her, you should go back. It's a little bit quiet. I should try going back. Um, but, but, you know, it's like the, the interesting thing is that I didn't, I looked at the pictures. So I'm happy I got something that says, you know, what I addressed what I saw. But I wasn't necessarily happy about it. And the nice thing about, you know, we were talking just now about Jimmy Stewart, who spent his whole life being an artist and pushing it with his music. And uh, he's in, you know, jazz whole fame and that kind of thing, but it's more than that. He's worked on like Thriller and his, uh, his, he has a classical music background, which he started, and, and he was sneaking into uh, um, a, a black jazz clubs in San Francisco. He's 15 years old. He's sneaking out of the house and sneaking into the, the place before they, they accepted him because he was doing uh, great stuff. And he's still, he's like 82 years old, and he's still 81, 82, and he's still blasting away. He can't use his hands because he had a stroke in 2008, and he had another stroke about a year and a half, two, two years ago. But he still, he has that fire in his belly. And that's where he gets, I mean, when we see him smile, it's, it's just absolutely amazing. And uh, the stuff, the people he knows and the people he influence, like 
Eagles and uh, people like that, uh, Santana, you know, all crazy about his music. And maybe that's what makes him smile. I'm still learning how to smile sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, like I have friends who, who do work which makes me happy when I see their work. But my own work, you know, it's, it's like it takes so long to, to even understand myself or what, what I like about something. I mean, look at the Lebanon work and there's pictures that, uh, black and white pictures I like better than most of the color pictures, but then there's color pictures I like a lot, and I was so happy that I made those pictures, but it, it's a weird kind of happiness because it's a, such a distance. I mean, because you grow, you don't, hopefully you don't stay in the same place. So it's, you know, maybe I can smile at something now that, I, that I've done, but most of the time it's just like you're like a dead, a dead rat looking at something <laughs> until, until you can sneak away and, and, and then really think about it and say, yeah, that was, it's pretty good. I'm happy with that. I could, I could die tomorrow and know I did this right, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I uh, the happiness thing, I, I get more humor, happiness out of looking at other people's work and I do my own. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a few images that, yeah, that make me happy or lie or lie around it. And, but uh, most of the time I'm still in that process until it's time for me to leave the planet. Then I'll, I'll have an idea of what I like and what I didn't. That's, I mean, that's, that's, I guess we were talking uh, a little bit before about the, you know, Goya's sorrows, uh, d uh, disasters of war, the famous images by Goya, which in many ways are the backdrop for a lot of modern war photography, I would say, and certainly of our, of our sort of very, very unmitigated, realistic image of war, bodies torn apart, draped from trees. But he used all of his aesthetic and artistic power to convey a non-delightful image of it. Mm -hmm. And fascinatingly, uh, he was making these while he was a court artist at the age of 62. Uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, he was making these images and he, he would not have them seen in his lifetime. He didn't show them to anybody. They were published 35 years afterwards. We think of them today as kind of one of the most important pieces of, as it were, social or an artist's response to his society. They're understood to have been a kind of protest and, mm -hmm. and a, a not just anti-war, but uh, much more complexly linked to their moment, though that fades away for us. And I wonder how, how you, you know, d confront as a curator and thinking about just in general the artisan society, not only in your work, but just sort of broadly, mm -hmm. this question of how do you um, get across uh, bluntly the thing that people want to look away from and make them look at it uh, without, without, in a sense, having to hammer them with a message? Mm -hmm. Or is it necessary not to hammer yeah. them with a message I, for that? I think that you know, the, the pictures that, that uh, work the best are the ones that connect with the humanity in each person. It's, it doesn't mean that it's, it's, a, uh, it's heroic or something, but you can see yourself inside the picture. I mean, that's, that's what I'm usually trying to do. I'm trying to, without thinking about it, it just happened that way because I've you know, experienced some things myself, but just getting inside, when you can see inside this other person's world and appreciate it a little bit more, perhaps, or connect it with your own world, no matter how bad or how good it is, you know, there's just a connection there someplace. I think that's what the best work is about. Mm -hmm. Makes you feel that, you know? It makes you feel that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't do blunt, uh, <laughs> per se, though I have great respect for artists and photojournalists and filmmakers who do. Um, I just, one aside, it was very interesting when you were talking about people reacting to your articles and your photographs with the phenomenon now of the likes on Instagram and Facebook. And I'm always torn because you see a death announcement or some horrific, and you like, and you like it. Yeah. And it's, it's just an odd disconnect <laughs> <laughs> that we experience now. But um, I was just thinking about introducing difficult subject matter and, and helping an audience experience that. I haven't yet been to the Museum of African American History in uh, Washington, D.C. that just opened. There's been the, a variety of Holocaust museums where you're really taking through uh, horrific moments in history. And often there is art woven in, but often it's also artifacts and such. But just as an, uh, an example of one way that we tried at the Brooklyn Museum this past weekend, you know, this feeling of helplessness that I think so many of us have right now. And we decided to open the museum for free, sent out, you know, this was on Thursday, so sent out a lot of um, calls through social media and said, come to the museum. 
and please spend time in our American galleries because they've been rehung. And they've been rehung to tell a very difficult story. The Brooklyn Museum's American collection is quite amazing, and it goes from not just colonial times, but pre-Columbian times, if you think about the Americas. And it's one of the first museums to tell that story of diversity, of um, the wide, wide range of populations that exist and flourished in this country and continent. Um, and just, it's not really about solace, though, of course, inviting people into your house, as it were, to spend time and not have to pay is one thing. But it was, you know, trying to model uh, a way of seeing and thinking that right now is sorely in danger. I also wanted to say one thing about, you mentioned the message mm -hmm. artists. I, I, I think that really great art um, has no message, uh, really. I mean, that, that is the power of it, and that is why it, why it disturbs. Uh, Baldwin talks about the fact that he is not a spokesman uh, for anyone. He's a witness. And in especially 20th and 21st century, we understand the importance of being a witness. And, and um, you said something, I think, in the other room. Anyway, I most probably am distorting everything you said. But, um, but um, it made me think that um, the power of art, the Goya you talk about, um, uh, is the fact that um, it reveals the truth. It goes beyond the illusions. Be it, it shows, and at the same time, it shows the extraordinariness of the ordinary. Because through the alternative eye of the artist, nothing is ordinary. Everything is unique, you know. And, and so these two qualities make it both pleasurable and highly dangerous and disturbing. Because once you know the truth, you have to take action. You can't remain silent. You know? And if you remain silent, at least you know that you have betrayed yourself. And, and the second thing that um, I wanted to talk about was, you know, I, I always think about food. I was telling you, when people, no, I mean, in, well, I'll tell you in what way. We were talking about, and I, w I was telling you about Iran, that everybody thinks Iran is this really, you know, terribly one-sided, um, made in the image of Ayatollah Khomeini. And, and, and Iranians are, in fact, such sensual, erotic people. If you look at the dances and, and actually the wine, which comes from Shiraz, you know. Um, the, we call Shiraz the land of nightingales and wine. Anyway, to, to uh, not go there. <laughs> um, what did I want to say about <laughs> Oh, yes, uh, the food. But I always tell people, you want to know what Iran is really about? Not, don't go and have just the kebabs. Have the real food. food yeah. Once you taste that duck with pomegranates and ground walnuts and the seven herbs that go with lime and, and oh my God, you know, there you are. You know, don't tell me if your national food is Kentucky Fried Chicken, <laughs> you know, that you are more erotic than Iranians. <laughs> no way. No bloody way, you know. But, but so I think that what, what art does, um, it awakens our senses. Um, Saul Bellow mm -hmm. used to talk about the fact that um, uh, in countries like Soviet Union, Stalin pours on the death and, and everything is very obvious. I mean, tyranny is obvious because they're killing people. They're putting them in, you know, in jail. They're torturing them. He said in the West, what threatens us is our atrophy of feeling and our sleeping consciousness. You know, and, and I feel that that is what art does to you. You go to Brooklyn Museum, you look at these, you, you know, you look at the photographs. I don't know if I can afford you, but if, you know, you eat his food for free because he's a friend. And, uh, 
Nice love try. It. <laughs> <laughs> Read about your book. Wasn't your book, um, didn't people say that you can't write a book about that kind of a thing, about genocide? Didn't Adorno say, can there be art after Auschwitz? I always felt there can only be art after Auschwitz. Of course. Because art is not like aspirin. It is not aspirin for the soul. It doesn't console you. It doesn't tell you how to be nice to your mom. But what it does, it makes you resist. It makes you resist the absoluteness of the cruelty of man and the absoluteness of time, of death. And, and, and so through the stories, the photographs, the paintings, the, the music, what happens, even the worst of them, what happens, they give you a sense of control. Because the story is not by destiny or some authoritarian figure. The story is your story, even if it is full of blood. And that it is the joy of discovery. Even when you go to a Holocaust Museum, which, you know, it is that joy of discovering something and, and being the wiser for it, I think. And we need it right now in these times, so people will just come to your museums and you know go wild <laughs> uh, over concerts and Shakespeare in the park, and you will give them free food. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've all got all of you. You <laughs> will. <laughs> you will give them free food. Well, as Bring as it to the park. Bring it to the park. Uh. We'll provide the wine. I know you won't approve of the wine we'll uh. provide, but nonetheless. <laughs> and I'm afraid that, uh, speaking of time, <laughs> it's up, uh, our, our 90 minutes here. Uh, I'm sure we could all go on, but um, I'm speaking of food. I'm sure everybody's hungry <laughs> or thirsty. And um, thank you. Thank you all for thank bringing you. what you brought. Thanks a lot.